And let me welcome all journalists that are listening through d different devices, those that are based in Cape Town and those that are here with us today. And uh, let me also greet the viewers at home that might be watching through uh, different broadcasters, SABC, ENCA, and Newsroom Africa. Uh, today, the Auditor General, uh, Mr. Gani Maluleka, will present her first uh, a general report on the national and provincial audit outcomes for the 2019-2020 financial year, which are normally audited under the, perform, uh, <coughs> the Public Finance Management Act. We are going to start with uh, the Auditor General, who is also accompanied by Ms. Alice Miller, who is the acting national leader at the Auditor General of South Africa. She will do a PowerPoint presentation, um, the copies of um, the media statement, uh, the journalists should already, should already have, those who don't, who don't have, Please indicate, just send a WhatsApp, we'll make sure that you receive it, including the presentation. The copy of the report itself is already being uploaded on our website, so you can quickly interact with the details on that particular, on that particular one. Uh, without any further ado, um, also note that we'll be taking the questions through uh, the normal, usual uh, electronic platforms. So I'll send your questions, we'll be able to answer all your questions, hopefully and provide you with the necessary details. Without any waste of time, allow me to invite the Auditor General, Mr. Gani Manulek. Thank you very much, Harold. Good morning, everybody. Good morning to the media, uh, members of the media. We. Thank you for the opportunity for us to share with you the insights derived from the work that our auditors conducted on the PFMA cycle uh, for the year ended March 2020. As you know that the work of the Auditor General derives out of the provisions of the Public Audit Act, but as well as the Public Finance Management Act. In this cycle, we audited the provincial departments, the national departments, state-owned entities, TVET colleges, as well as the public entities in both spheres of, of government. The expenditure budget that was the subject of our audits amounted to a total of 1.7 trillion rand. Financial year 2020 was, was really completed under the most extraordinary circumstances. With the COVID-19 pandemic and the resultant lockdowns, we had uh, the impact of it being the extension of the submission deadlines for the financials, which was moved from the 31st of May to the end of July. A consequence of that is that our audits were then conducted later than usual. In that time, uh, we must recognize that the resilience the adaptability and the partnership between the teams at the auditees and the teams of the Auditor General of South Africa, that has stood us in good stead. And it is credit to them that we're able to report to you on the outcomes of these audits. The annual performance, the annual financial statements and performance reports, as I've said, were, were conducted under these extraordinary difficult times. And so it is only on the 31st of March for the new year that we are still reporting on the 2020 financial year. But that's the nature of, of how things panned out in the context of, of the world we're living in now. In reflecting on 2020, it's helpful to go back to where we ended when we reported on the year ended March 2019. At that time, we issued a clarion call. We called on the political leadership, the administrative leadership across all of government to focus on acting now on accountability. And at that time, we, we spoke to the new administration and indicated the importance of implementing sustainable solutions to preventative controls in implementing consequence management, effective consequence management where that was required. At that time, we also highlighted the importance of instilling good financial management practices. And we, when we spoke to the new administration then, we encouraged them to use every opportunity to drive progressive and sustainable changes. You recall that we repeated this call when we issued the special report number one and special report number two 
on the real-time audits that we conducted on the COVID-19 relief fund. You may recall that at that time we audited across the PFMA cycle a number of initiatives and a number of expenditures that were associated with different relief programs responding to the pandemic. And at that time, we highlighted the same message. As we reflect on 2020, we note that our messages from the previous year have not been heeded. Whilst we're seeing some signs of improvement in this year, we remain somewhat concerned that we're not seeing the progressive and sustainable improvements that are required. We're not seeing that there are improvements in addressing the widespread weaknesses in basic financial management controls. Things such as implementing the audit action plans that are designed at the end of the previous financial audit. Things such as making sure that our IT controls are dealt with, record keeping is addressed, in-year management reports on financial issues are, are, are prepared mm -hmm. and that decisions are made on credible financial and performance information. We're not seeing those critical disciplines that must become a feature if we are going to spend wisely and deliver effectively. In noting that the status of internal controls has not improved, we can only look to the role that must be played by senior managers across government, by accounting officers, supported effectively by their internal audit functions as well as their audit committees. We've noted some encouraging improvements in the assurance provided by the executive authorities, by the coordinating departments. Notably, we've seen greater support offered by the provincial treasuries and the offices of the premiers in different parts of the country. And we're also seeing that the role played by portfolio committees as well as by public accounts committees across the legislatures, that is improving. So the critical aspect that needs great attention is what happens at the administration level under the leadership of accounting officers and accounting authorities acting in a manner consistent with their responsibilities as set out in Section 38 of the PFMA and Section 51 of the PFMA. The outcomes indicate that, yes, we've seen a slight increase in the number of clean audits. And just to remind you that the definition of a clean audit is that audit outcome where there has been evidence of credible financial information, of reliable and useful performance information, as well as having no significant findings on compliance matters relating to financial and performance management. And that's what we then call a clean audit, and we often denote it in the green. The next category is the yellow zone, which is really where an auditee has been able to deliver financial information which at the end of the process we can confirm is credible. However, they have some finding either on performance information which is not useful or reliable, or they have a prevalence of significant non-compliance in the area of financial and performance management. The next few categories would include qualified audit opinions where the audit statements have some concern in terms of their credibility and there's a finding on compliance and performance information. And then the next level would be the adverse and the disclaimer audit opinions, which are even less desirable than the ones I've spoken to now. So this year, we've seen an increase in the number of clean audits, a decrease in the number of disclaimer audit opinions, and we've seen a decrease in the number of qualified audit opinions. This year, we're seeing that the dominance of the yellow zone continues, where a number of auditees end up with unqualified with findings. And yes, it's important to celebrate when an auditee realizes that important milestone where they have credible financial information. Our concern is that often amongst these auditees, not only do they not have the disciplines that allow them to prepare credible financial information in year, they are also unable to give us quality financial statements at the beginning of the audit process. In fact, only 49% of auditees submitted quality financial information at the beginning of the audit process. Some of these auditees end up with a number of compliance findings, especially in the area of procurement, 
meaning that the manner in which they procure goods and services is not consistent with the principles set out in the Constitution, specifically Section 217, and it is not consistent with the prescripts set out by the National Treasury. The clean audits, when we look at them in relation to the expenditure budget, represent 17% of the expenditure budget. The unqualified audit opinions, 40% of the expenditure budget, which says to you that 57% of the expenditure budget is being spent by entities that are able to present credible financial information, and the balance simply aren't. There is, in this year, a prevalence of auditees that we were unable to complete the work on as at the cutoff date for our analysis. So as at the end of November, there were a number of audits, 44 in particular, that we had not yet completed. We've subsequently completed those audits, and in our general report, we set out the outcomes of those audits. And many of them have a similar profile in terms of audit outcomes, so it doesn't change the picture in terms of the message that we're sharing with you today, where there are far too few clean audits, a dominance of unqualified, which have major concerns around disciplines, internal controls, stability of how they are being run, and compliance, as well as the qualified, adverse, and disclaimer opinions. In this year, we've seen 66 auditees improve their audit outcome category. Either they moved from unqualified to clean, or qualified to clean, or qualified to unqualified. However, that's set back by the regression. 35 of them went backwards into a less desirable audit outcome. And we keep grappling with why that would be. What is it that makes an auditee improve vis-a-vis -vis one that regresses? And the one aspect that remains quite compelling as a key contributor to improvement in outcome is the stability and the filling of vacancies at key roles, specifically accounting officer and CFO. Over the years, our analysis has demonstrated a very high correlation between the tenure of an accounting officer and CFO and the audit outcomes. Many of the disclaimers are those where you don't have a C CFO that stays more than 22 months, on average, five years. So when we talk about the importance of filling these key vacancies and the importance of dealing with whatever risks there are towards the longer tenure of the appointed people, those principles, those concerns remain top of mind as we analyze these audit outcomes. One of the areas that we are flagging in this, in this report is one that we flagged before around the financial health risks that present themselves as we interrogate the financial statements of different auditees across government. Specifically amongst departments, we found that two thirds of them had some or other indication of financial strain. We found that 12% of them reported themselves in their financial statements that they were concerned about their ability to continue to operate. We found that there were 2% of them with financial statements where we could not even conduct that level of assessment. And if we go back and understand what are these indicators that the AG looks at when we consider the risks to financial health, it is the inability to pay creditors on time. It is the inability to collect debtors in the way that one should on time. It is operating on a net deficit for the year where the revenue is exceeded by expenditure for the year. It's about auditees where you find at the end of the year they've got a budget, that they've overspent on their budget such that they have unauthorized expenditure, but they actually have spent last next year's budget in this year. They've already spent a significant component of the forthcoming year's budget to fund operating expenses for this year, which then eats away at the ability to deliver services in the forthcoming year. Of particular concern in terms of the, the departments that, that have these high level of, of financial health indicators would be the provincial departments of education in many parts of the country, as well as the provincial departments of health in many parts of the country. On the departments of health, one of the major, major concerns is the dominance of these litigation claims, medical negli negligence claims, which have the impact 
of eating away at the ability of, an in, of a provincial department to deliver services in the forthcoming year. Because they do not budget for, for these medical negligence claims, whatever they end up paying in this year is going to take away the ability to fill vacancies, to deliver services, to pay suppliers the following year, to buy or maintain the equipment that they require to deliver services at the level that is desired. We've also looked at the state-owned entities and the stories around the number of state-owned entities that have financial health pressures, those are well documented in the public. We ordered the majority of state-owned entities. Um, on, of the Schedule II entities, there are probably two of the biggest, biggest ones that we do not yet audit, being Transnet and ESCOM. However, the large number of auditees, the Office of the Auditor General has been taking on those audits over a number of years now. So our report covers a large component of the state-owned entities. Financial health pressures are dominant in many of these. And without going into too much detail, I will highlight that as at the end of the financial year, there were a number of state-owned entities already at the end of March whose situation would have probably deteriorated as we look into the end of March 2021. A number of those had operated with a deficit for the year, had creditors le being left unpaid for extended periods. A number of them even had adverse or disclaimer audit opinions, mainly because of not being able to apply the going concern assumption. Put simply, it's saying that as auditors, we were uncomfortable that those entities, without a guaranteed capital injection or a major shift in how they are operating, that they would be able to continue to operate into the foreseeable future. Often we talk about state-owned entities, the big ones. What often gets lost in the conversation are the smaller public entities. Over a number of years now, we've highlighted financial health risks at a number of smaller public entities for whom, if this continues, they will end up requiring capital injection either from their provincial governments or from national government. So these risks at these smaller public entities equally have to be attended to. For six years now, we've reported on financial health risks at Sunrail, at Road Accident Fund, as well as at Golden Leopards, which is one of the entities in the Northwest province. And the list goes on in terms of how over many years we've highlighted financial health risks as some of these smaller uh, entities, whom, as I say, if we do not attend to, will end up placing a greater burden on, on the fiscus. One of the areas that forms part of our compliance audit every single year is that on supply chain management. And we focus on this because we know that whilst there are a number of auditees that end up with compliance findings, whenever we drill deeper, we find that it is in the procurement area where they have challenges. And the areas where we, we, we find problems are around not having the discipline to ensure that there are competitive bids, even matters such as making sure that there are enough quotes that are sourced before a decision is made to procure goods and services. We're seeing still a prevalence of extensions uh, and amendments to contracts that are existing. Instead of going out to the market to confirm that that which we are paying for on this particular contract remains fair and reasonable, we simply extend the contract. That compromises the confidence that citizens must have about fair and equitable access to business opportunities within government. It tarnishes the ability of government to demonstrate that its systems of procurement are transparent and that they're competitive mm -hmm. and that whatever they, they procure is done in a cost-efficient manner. An area of weakness continues to be where the regulations around local, local content are flouted. At the point of procurement, decisions are being made in a way that is not in compliance with the stipulated bid specifications around local com content. When this continues, we then make it difficult for government to meet its stated policy objectives. 
of using its significant procurement spend to drive local economic activity, to drive the preservation of jobs, the creation of new jobs, and to ensure that local uh, operators in the economy benefit from government spend. Another area that we believe is an issue for the policymakers is where the preferential procurement system is not being applied properly. So when government then sets out the, the requirements for how the procurement system ought to run in a way that finds a balance between empowerment on the one hand, which is imperative, and cost effectiveness on the other hand, which is also an imperative. So then there's this procurement system that's set out with those regulations to support those dual objectives, and those get flouted. Then unfortunately, we spend a great deal of time figuring out if there's something wrong with the policy. Meanwhile, one of the key levers for us to achieve what we've all stated is, is important is happening in the context of where procurement actually is being decided upon, where those rules are not being, simply not being applied. Another area that we flag in this audit is that we are still seeing a number of public officials, political office bearers, <coughs> and public servants doing business with the state. And that is not in accordance with the public service regulations as recently amended. As of April 2016, that's been outlawed. And in fact, public servants were given up until the end of February 2017 to either stop doing business with the state or resign from their role as public officials. What we're seeing is that there are still some contracts continuing to be entered into and paid for where public servants are the counterparties or the business people. And yes, there's the role for the employee, but also there's a role for the entity that is procuring for them to set up rules and systems and processes that will detect these, these uh, non-compliances and act on them. We're also sti still seeing instances of false declarations made by, by suppliers such that it is difficult for those that procure goods and services to demonstrate that they have avoided instances of conflicts of interest and the impact thereof. And the last feature I want to talk to around supply chain management is in the area where in some instances, we cannot find the documentation that supports transactions that have gone through the books. So we find a transaction, we then ask for documentation to support that transaction so that we can confirm whether or not compliance has been a feature in the course of entering into that transaction. And in, in, the, in uh, contracts to the level of two billion rand, we were unable to find the documentation which placed an, a limitation on our ability to procure, to, to complete our interrogation. Supply chain management non-compliances end up in many instances as irregular expenditure. And this year's irregular expenditure number that we're reporting on is 54.3 billion rand. It is less than last year's 66.9 billion rand. However, this is no reason to celebrate. We must highlight that the 54 billion rand that we're reporting on must be understood in a context where 31% of auditees, 118 auditees, were not disclosing their irregular expenditure accurately. There was some doubt about the completeness 